we go further. Um, my name is Maria Lubrano, and I want to thank you so much for joining me and my coworker, Lam Lu. Lam, could you just? Everyone. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, um, thank you. We both thank you so much for um, joining today's presentation, um, which is hosted by our office, the Maritime Retirees Relations Center. Um, and we are so happy to um, have today Dr. Linda Ercoli. Um, who is a licensed clinical psychologist with a specialty in neuropsychology and geriatrics, um, who will be speaking with us today on the benefits of lifelong learning. Uh, Linda oversees the Longevity Center programs and writes many of the memory training programs and educational curriculums and directs the creation of new programs. Um, she can tell you a little bit more about herself as well, but um, at this point, I'd like to ask that you please join Lam and I in um, welcoming Dr. Ercoli to uh, speak to us today. Um, but really quickly, before you go on, Dr. Ercoli, typically um, our format for our presentations is 45 minutes um, straight through and then 15 minutes at the end for question and answers. Is that ideal for you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So we'll keep everyone muted um, until the end of your presentation, and then we'll have uh, some time for questions and answers. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Maria and Lam, for ha having me here today. And, and I'm really excited to be here and glad that I'm able to chat with you today about lifelong learning. So um, I'm going to get started. I'm going to share my screen. So let me make sure I do that right now. Make sure that I can get this up here. Hold on. Okay. Is every, everyone able to see that all right? Yes. Yes. Right. Fantastic. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the benefits of lifelong learning and also memory training and, and or cognitive stimulation. And these are two things that we do at the Longevity Center and we have experience in research in this area, as well as uh, what some of our programs offer. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about what's important and what is the benefit of lifelong learning? Well, the first thing that we all want to think about is aging successfully. And that means that having a, having a good quality of life as we age and being able to really do the things that we enjoy to do and having a fulfilling life. So the, the formula to age successfully is to keep physically active, to keep mentally active, to reduce our stress and eat well and have a healthy diet so that we can, of course, nourish all our body and our brain to while we're aging. We should be doing this actually all the while, right, through our lives, but it's particularly important as we age. So let's take a look at what happens to our thinking and our cognition in normal aging and through not so normal aging. So the first is when we're younger. And if you look at cognition is going up this, the Y or the vertical axis and age, meaning that we get older, goes from left to right on the bottom. We think about through normal aging, our cognition is good for many, many, many years. And then some of us, we start to develop some mild cognitive problems as we get older. That is somewhere between normal aging and having a more serious uh, cognitive problem like a dementia, okay? A dementia like Alzheimer's disease. And um, essentially what we know is that this stage here of mild cognitive impairment can be due to a lot of things. It can be due to somebody being depressed, it can be due to having health problems, or it can be due to something else that is in essence is brewing uh, in our health, in our health system, underlying medical conditions that continue to get worse and ultimately, ultimately end up in dementia. 
So dementia is a state of being in um, cognitive, really, uh, impairment. But the impairment is severe so that people can't live independently. So we all forget where our keys are. We all occasionally forget what someone tells us. But dementia is much more serious than that. It's people who cannot live alone because they forget you know, uh, how to pay their bills. They don't eat enough. They forget to eat. They can't remember consistently what people tell them. They get lost. So the common form of dementia that we can think of is either Alzheimer's disease, right, that we hear a lot about. But there's many kinds of dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. So we, what we want to do, though, is to try to back this up and, and really intervene in our life, right, sorry about that, before people get to that stage. So in, in this case, if, if you look at this trajectory, memory gets worse over time. And this is when you do nothing about it, there's this point where it just keeps going downhill. But through education, exercise, and healthy lifestyle, we can slow memory decline. And the idea here is to live a healthy lifestyle, right, that includes lifelong education, eating well, and to extend this, this trajectory out so that decline is not so fast and it happens later in life. So this is what we're trying to do. Right, and so, what we look at here is most people, when they find out that they've got a problem, right, they intervene, but it's, it's too little too late. The, it, it's already, um, the, the process has really a kind of a snowball effect as, at a certain point. And so what we try to do isn't really making a dent. So what, is our, what does our cognition look like? We saw the trajectory. That doesn't happen to all people, but it can happen to many people. What we do know about our cognition and why it's important to engage in lifelong learning is that there are some things that we can boost with lifelong learning and some things that we don't boost so well. So let's take a look at what our cognitive functions are like as we age. You can think of our cognitive abilities in, in two camps. One is what we call crystallized knowledge or old knowledge. These are the things that we learn in our culture, in our work, through school. And it, we learn it uh, when we're young and we also get exposed to this information over and over again. So it's really solid, okay, in our, in our memories. And in fact, this type of knowledge or some people even call it wisdom, as we get older, improves or is at least stable until like we're in our 70s. And then it does tend to decline a little bit. The types of information that we have a hard time remembering and learning as we get older are what we call fluid intelligence or new knowledge, things that we uh, learn just like recently or how quickly our brain processes information reasoning, uh, flexibility in our thinking. These are the kinds of abilities that really decline earlier. Like our mental speed starts to slow down really in our late 20s, if you can believe it. But a lot of people don't notice it. But when we get into our 40s, we start to notice that uh, our mental speed is not as fast, right? So these, So what we're trying to capitalize on is slowing the change in this area and boosting the old knowledge and crystallized intelligence and capitalizing it. So again, the upside though of aging is that we call some aspects of intelligence might even increase with age. One is our vocabulary. And again, the, our ability to interpret knowledge as we get older because we have so much experience, right? And in many, many people, stress and worry diminishes as they get older, probably because they've had a lot of life experience and they're able to interpret and, and face things in life with a, a different point of view than when folks are younger. 
So this brings us to lifelong learning and why we're even having this talk today is what is it? So first of all, it's voluntary learning. It's something that you initiate yourself and it's focused on personal development and fulfillment. It's not, uh, it's not education that's compulsory or that somebody forces you to do. And there's really no standard definition. It's really anything formal or informal that helps you develop, become fulfilled, and, and you want to engage in to expand your mind and your life experience. So it could be anything like learning a new skill, whether you take on a new hobby, you learn to play, let's say, golf, uh, you learn photography, you join the Toastmasters Club. It's anything you can learn by yourself. So maybe you're, you're learning a new language on an app, for example, or you're listening to a podcast, you're taking mindfulness classes, um, you're coming to this meeting, for example, learning a new sport, learning how to use new technology. So you get a, a, a new smartphone or you get an iPad, you've not had one before, and acquiring new knowledge. So taking a college course, for example, or some other kind of, of course in the classroom or online. Now, how to engage in lifelong learning is really you just do it. You follow your interests and your curiosities, right? Everything that you do counts. Make a list of things that you'd like to do, for example, or learn. And then think about how would you like to do that? Do you wanna join a club? Do you wanna do it yourself and read? watch videos, take a class, and then try to build that learning into your daily life. So how much time can you spend learning? And maybe you have, you're retired and you feel like you have a lot of time, or maybe you don't have more than an hour a day. Whatever you do, you just try to schedule it into your daily life, make some commitment towards doing it and have some real, realistic expectations. So certainly if you're gonna learn a new language on an app and you only have 15 minutes a day, right? That's going to be different than taking a course or having a more immersive experience. But it, it doesn't matter. I mean, anything that you do is, is gravy. What are the benefits of lifelong learning? Well, this is what the research has shown. First of all, uh, it improves people's self-confidence and it gives people a stronger uh, broader sense of purpose in life, more motivation. You can meet people. You can have better cognitive functioning through lifelong learning, better, better brain functioning. And also learning stimulates something called plasticity in the brain. That means the brain changes and builds connection and increases neurons. And that's what learning is. Learning is changing the brain based on experience and exposure. So let's talk about some lifelong learning research. <clears throat> One is that mental exercise might stave off cognitive decline. So we think of mental exercise and stimulation. It, it, these studies usually have people do something specific, but what they do is it activates neural circuits and it's associated with lowering, lowering one's risk for dementia. Some of these studies are experimental where they actually put people through programs and then look at their brain function before and after. And some of these studies are what we call um, more uh, epidemiological, like they follow a large group of people over the years and those are very difficult and expensive studies to conduct, but they survey what their cognitive and mental stimulation is. And then they follow them and see who develops cognitive problems in later life. And what these studies show is that the more you do, especially in midlife, whether it be living a healthy lifestyle or staying mentally stimulated, the more, it's, the, the more you reap the benefits in later life by staving off cognitive decline. Other things that people can do that, that are valuable exercises, again, is to learn, to, to learn something new, 
and uh, keep learning or to have um, or to learn when you're younger. That's always like a uh, kind of like a buffer. The more you learn when you're younger, the more it buffers you for future cognitive decline. Bilingualism is a great thing. People who are bilingual actually work harder in their brain. Their brain is always trying to decide which language do I use, which word do I use, and their brain is much more flexible and their thinking is much more flexible than people that are not bilingual. Certainly doing puzzles and even sharing ideas. Some studies have shown that just leisure activities, engaging in leisure activities like dancing, games, things like that, um, sports can also help stave off cognitive decline. I wanna just show you a, a, a study that we did here at UCLA, with people who um, before and after cognitive training, this is uh, a study that Gary Small did. And basically this is called an FR, a fMRI. It is a, an MRI of the brain that looks at brain function. And this up here is the front of the brain and this is the back of the brain. And you're like, you're looking from the top inside the brain. And these red areas here is the activity of the brain. And what it shows is that the brain is, is working pretty hard um, to think. And then after two weeks of brain training, you see that there is less red, right, in the brain because the brain is not working as hard anymore. It is becoming more efficient in how it functions. And we see this type of pattern a lot in people that are learning something new, right? So in the beginning, their brain is really lighting up. It's working very hard. And then once you start to learn and, and kind of get into habit, learn the information, then your brain doesn't work as hard anymore because it's functioning more efficiently. So this is a pattern we see quite a bit in the research in people who are learning something new. Studies show that reading books could be tied to a longer life. So th this is a study of over 3,635 3, people over 50. And they found that they looked at people who were readers and people who were not readers, right? They're, they're cl classified themselves as readers, not readers. And they found that readers lived about two years longer than non-readers. And even just those who said, okay, all I do is read 30 minutes a day, they still have a surviving survival advantage over people who don't read. So reading is a good thing to do. Having conversation with people improves mental acuity and cognitive abilities. So these were studies done in both younger adults and older adults. And when they found that even just having, um, uh, you know, playing a, a game, you know, having a conversation actually improved mental speed. And um, they found this effect in both younger adults and older adults. So people would, for example, solve puzzles faster, et cetera. We also know that there are many social benefits of, of uh, having conversations and just having contact with other people. It reduces stress and um, it, it also, we know is important for social connectivity, right? That social connectivity or having friends and support is really a boost towards one's immune system um, and reduces stress and is fulfilling. So all of these are threats against cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. Some of the areas that even a simple conversation uh, you have with someone, it really activates the whole brain. So you think, well, it's just my mouth, you know, but no, it's everything. So your frontal lobes are very important in reasoning and retrieving. Your uh, language centers are in the frontal lobes, and these are essential for producing speech. We have um, the sensory motor area here going over the top of the brain. So we talk about body language. We talk about this is the part that actually controls our 
our tongue, our face, our memory and emotional um, functions are in this temporal lobe here and both on the surface and also very deep into the temporal lobe, which is not showing up here on this scan. And of course, the visual cortex is for reading uh, nonverbal cues, but it's also for just taking in information. And all these areas that we're talking about, none of them work by themselves. There is interconnectivity between all of these areas. So the brain really functions like an orchestra, right? And though you have different sections of the brain that kind of do their own thing, it's not an orchestra without all of it working together. And that is how, uh, in a very oversimplified term or explanation is how our brain functions. So whenever we're doing brain exercises or we're engaging in conversations, just remember you are engaging your whole brain. Learning something new. Let's talk about music, learning a, a musical instrument. And that also stimulates brain plasticity, in other words, brain development. So this was a study done where they took 150 six older adults who did not play a musical instrument, right? Never did. And they were assigned to either six months of weekly piano lessons or to like a music appreciation, music listening class. And they all received those brain MRIs that I showed you earlier before and then after the six month of classes. And the study looked at areas of the brain that were involved in music processing. So whether these are a lot of temporal lobe areas on the left and the right that were involved in uh, melody generation, um, processing, analyzing music and pitch, et cetera. So what, what did they find? First of all, there were greater increases in the thickness of the outside of the brain, which is called the cortex, in five of the 12 brain regions that they studied in the people who took piano lessons compared to the people who took just music listening. So the music listening group actually showed no increases in their, in their cortical thickness over the six months and some regions even thinned over six months. And so these are the regions that they looked at. And here are those temporal lobe regions again. So essentially playing the piano prevented age-related brain thinning and caused an increase in the surface of the brain getting thicker, right, the cortex, in certain brain regions. And these were particularly in these temporal regions that they looked at involved in music analysis and production. What about if you take a cognitive training class? Like you say, okay, I want to improve my memory and I want to do this either by taking a class or maybe I want to get on the internet and do a computer training program. What does the research show here? It's usually pretty good stuff. Um, first of all, just to point out that the goal of this type of memory intervention is to really support independent living and improve the quality of life. That's why people invented or, or, or created these types of interventions and classes. So people can get different types of training. You can get training that just helps you compensate for your age-related memory changes. In other words, we don't, we don't know that these these types of uh, strategies are going to turn the clock back and, and actually change your brain, although the evidence suggests that they do to some extent, but they help you compensate for your, for your memory shortcomings. Then there's people that actually say, okay, I want to improve my cognition. These are usually done uh, types of trainings that are done on computers that focus on speed and reasoning. Then there are people can use practical aids. This isn't really exercising your brain, but people can use post-it notes, calendars, and reminders. And then there's a separate category of rehabilitation where somebody goes to a specialist to regain brain function uh, after an injury, like a stroke 
or a traumatic brain injury. So I'm going to focus mo mostly on the first two, compensation and cognitive improvement. So memory really is a process. It's a process for learning something new, storing it for later use, and then retrieving that information when you need it. And there are a number of stories that you may or may not have heard of that are very helpful in compensating for minor memory challenges with age. So you can form stories to help you remember things. You can, there are techniques to remember faces and names. There's a technique where you can use your home and associate what you want to remember with the rooms in your house. And these are all what we call mnemonic techniques, Greek word meaning memory aids. But you can use these tricks of the trade and, and um, techniques to help you, to help boost your recall. You can also enhance your focus and your attention, which is actually number one, if you want to improve your memory. If you're not paying attention, you're going to have a poor memory. And, and you can also learn how to improve your reasoning, that we said, or your speed of thinking. At, at the Longevity Center, we focus on teaching these memory techniques. So the Roman room method, forming stories. We also um, teach people how to enhance their attention. And we do provide people with training on how to use practical aids like technology and reminders. So one of the ways that you can think about en uh, enhancing your memory is to use association. Now, our, our brain automatically does this. Our brain learns by association. That's really what learning is. It's, it's taking information and making all sorts of connections among things that, um, that help us retrieve that information later on. So if you think of the word Frank right here in the middle of this wheel, right? You, can, you have many associations to the word Frank. You might think of a hot dog. You could think of the word, the definition of being honest and truthful, you could think, well, it sounds like the first name of a city like Frankfurt, or you might think of actors or singers whose names begin with Frank, or maybe you have an uncle Frank, maybe, maybe you know somebody named Frank. And so this is what association is. And it's like you have this central piece of information is the hub of the wheel and all these different folks or connections reach out to these different other things that Frank reminds you of. And then of course, if you really want to take it further, our brain is full of these, but there's so many other connections that come right from all of these other things that we remember. So for a hot dog, what are you going to think about? You might think of mustard and ketchup, right? For um, Frank Sinatra, you might think of, you know, bewitched, bothered, and bewildered. So again, we have many, many connections to information. And so you can learn techniques that help you capitalize on these associations to improve your memory. Remembering faces and names is another way to use these techniques. So let's say you just met your new neighbor and her name is Roseanne. And the idea of this technique is to focus on a facial feature that, that you're in order for you to look at that person's face. So you might wanna focus on her eyes. Maybe she has rosy cheeks. So you think of Rose and Roseanne. You might think of her smile. And um, you might think of her hair, her nose anything, her forehead. And the idea is if you look at a facial feature, that forces you to pay attention to somebody's face. Because I don't know if you noticed it, but I certainly noticed it, that sometimes I'm introduced to people, but I'm really not looking at them. And then I see them again, and I don't recognize them. It's because I never really looked at their face. And so you might think of this woman 
as some connection between her name, right, and her face. So in this example, you might think of Roseanne with rosy cheeks, or you might think of her with a rose in her hair. But the idea is when you make that connection, then you forces you to look at the face, and you've also what formed an association, which will help you remember her name later. So again, association and and uh, paying attention are two very important ways to enhance your memory. So when they've done studies that looked at the, the effects of this kind of training, they've found that this kind of training is associated with brain plasticity, meaning making new connections and possibly with neural protection. So what they, they looked at in this particular study, uh, the, the researchers taught people what we teach in our longevity class, which is the Roman room method. It, te it taught them to use the rooms of their house to remember a list of items. And they had younger and older adults. And then they had people who have some cognitive weaknesses and people who didn't in the study. And so they trained everybody and then on these tasks. And, uh, and of course, some people didn't get the training. And then they looked at the functioning in specific brain regions. And so again, what did they find in this study on the brain scans with these temporal areas, frontal areas, and also these more uh, posterior or back of the brain regions were activated more in older adults who benefited from the training. So learning this technique was associated with increased brain activity. And the younger adults also showed the um, kind of the addition of more frontal activation. And uh, that makes sense because as we get older, our frontal lobe activity is not as strong as it used to be. So, but younger adults, it's still pretty strong or it is stronger. And so they showed the addition of a benefit to that region. They also found some neurochemical changes in the memory center of the brain, which is called the hippocampus, in older participants who received mnemonic training. And these neurochemical changes were associated with the types of, of uh, chemical changes that, um, that are related to neuroprotection in the brain. So in other words, protecting neurons. So this study showed a positive impact on that type of training on brain function and brain chemistry. And so this is what it looks like. Again, you see some activation in these back areas here and in these frontal regions. And it, it, again, this is um, front of the brain, back of the brain. And what you see is the young folks here have activation in both areas, whereas older folks tend to have activation more in the back of the brain. So here's, here's another study where, um, again, this is the numbers that showed you what happened in that particular study. And take it, if you just look at this chart below, you see that there's um, the young adults and old adults who improved and old adults who, older adults who did not improve on memory tests before and after that training. And you can see that the um, younger adults had a little more of a boost from 8.69 to 13.81, which is their score. And the older adults improved about almost four points, but the unimproved adults declined. And what they found when they went back and said, why did some adults, older adults improve and some did not, is because the older adults who didn't improve weren't using the technique or they didn't use it correctly. So using the technique appeared to be directly responsible for the better performances on the cognitive testing.
we also looked at other other um, people looked at other types of studies that looked at FDG PET, which is glucose metabolism and uh, brain function using M, uh, MRI. And again, in these studies, the scan showed improvements in those same areas, which is the temporal part of the brain, right, the sides, the frontal lobes, and the back of the brain, the occipital areas. We also looked at other, other, other studies have looked at the impact of brain structure and function associated with a different type of training. It's called executive function training. And these are usually functions that are related to speed, reasoning, mental flexibility. And so in this study, they looked at the effects of that type of training on brain and cognition in healthy older adults. And they looked at this across 20 studies. So this, this type of study where you, you study a bunch of studies and you tally up all their results and statistically analyze it, it's called a meta-analysis. And this is one of the most powerful ways to look at a, a body of data. And then you also take into account in these meta-analyses, the quality of the study, right? Like how many people? And is it, is it a good research design? So you're, they were able to pool these 20 studies and have a total of 635 healthy adults in the, across four different continents. And their ages ran, range from 60 to 88. And they looked at different types of training, computer training, a training that looked at your ability to inhibit, in other words, stop your brain from doing something. And did a combination. And what's important is that most of the training was an adaptive means that as you get better in the training, the training gets harder. Okay. So in other words, if you can remember five words, then the next time they're going to ask you to remember eight words. And if you can remember eight words, then they're going to ask you to remember 10 words. Okay. So what did they show? The, the results show that this type of training might protect against cortical and subcortical atrophy, meaning that both the external parts of the brain and deep in the brain atrophy less in the people with training. And so what they found was increases in brain gray matter, in the blood flow of the brain, and also better connectivity in the memory-related regions of the brain, including the hippocampus, and again, areas in that very important temporal lobe. So I, I threw a lot at you, but I wanted to really give you a good cross-section of information about how training in uh, memory techniques or on the computer can definitely enhance brain function and performance on cognitive tests. So what, what we do, just taking the, the last bit of time to kind of give a little plug to the Longevity Center is, what do we do there? And, and can this be helpful to people? So we have a number of programs at the Longevity Center. First of all, we do memory education and stimulation programs. So we teach all these techniques, as I mentioned before, in a, a four-week class, or you could also take one three-hour class and have like a crash course in how to use your visual imagery and association to remember information. We also have a senior scholars program, which is a, an excellent lifelong learning uh, approach where people can audit UCLA undergraduate classes. That means that you can listen to professors' lectures, either in person or online. And we run our program four times a year that is commensurate with the, all the quarters of education at UCLA, right? 
So we do spring, summer, fall, and winter courses. So in November, right now, we're recruiting for uh, winter classes at UCLA. We also have webinars that we offer for free to the community. And um, we have a, we just, somebody donated, uh, gave us a donation to create a resource directory that you can go to on our website and just look up all the interesting things at UCLA for people 50 and over. It could be where to eat on campus, what's, what's going on at the Poly Pavilion in our, in our uh, sports centers and what's going on at the museums. And so this is just a great resource for people who want to come to UCLA campus and engage in some activities. So I told you a little bit about our, our memory classes, but essentially the program's been available in more than a dozen US states and in a few different countries. And it's taught remotely and in person. And um, I talked about that. Our brain, our brain bootcamp programs are shorter versions where we teach you how memory works. And you also get uh, tips on physical health um, and, and memory health diet, exercise, et cetera. These are some of the, the webinars that we've had over the last, I would say since May. Uh, and these are all available on our website, but we, we did, uh, it, it covers longevity, it, cause, it covers um, just very interesting topics. This one was by a, a medical doctor on campus who talked about female health across the tree of life and talked about what we learn about female health from the other animals on the planet. We also have a, a lecture on supplements and nutrition for brain health. So just to, I wanted to leave enough time for a talk. It's about 45 minutes. So just to let you know, again, that really there are potential benefits to lifelong learning. I would say they're more than potential. They're, they're empirically supported by the research. Uh, some of this has to do with improved uh, mental skills, improved brain functioning, improved well-being and, and uh, mental health, and stronger social networks. So if, you, if you're interested about the Longevity Center, there is our uh, website. You can check us out. And I just want to thank you and open up the floor to questions. I did see a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, the first one, it looks like maybe there's three. Uh, Laura asks, she says, I heard Alzheimer's is related to digestive problems. Any comments? Does UCLA do studies about this? I don't. I don't know. I, yes, there is some relationship among all the many things that could be related to Alzheimer's disease, but I don't know um, that we're doing any here at UCLA. What I would recommend, and I'll put it in the chat, um, if I can chat it in, is to look at the UCLA Easton, East, Easton Center. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. And this is called the Mary Easton Center. Now, this has clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. I don't know that any of them involve the gut, but you could also take a look at what um, what they're doing at other universities to see if any if anybody else is doing this research. I just don't know if we're doing it here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that, yeah. No, that's good. And um, just also just to interject, we will be sending up a follow-up email to everyone who attends and we'll try to put as many resources in that email as well. Um, the next question is from Robert and he says, does continued engagement with crystallized learning help ward off mental decline or just new learning? That's a really good question. I don't know that anybody has done that exact study, but, but 
let me put it to you another way. So crystallized intelligence is there already, but accessing it is good for the brain. That's why when um, people get Alzheimer's disease, really what they're left with is a lot of crystallized knowledge. And that's why for individuals that are having memory problems, you want to engage them in what we call reminiscence, right? Reminiscence therapy, talking about the past, talking about what they know. Now for those individuals, it's too late to ward off dementia, but it is still very good for their brain stimulation. It's much better than sitting around alone, right? Not engaging with anyone, not thinking. Um, new learning or fluid intelligence I think is kind of where it's at as far as if you're trying to stave off cognitive decline, then you do want to try to make new connections in the brain, right? So learning something new is a way to make new connections. Um, your brain also does something, it rewires too, right? That's what rehabilitation is about. So Certainly for people that have had brain injuries, um, they should, probably should be doing a combination of both, right? You're trying to rewire your brain. So you, you can do both, you know, working on old information and trying to enhance, for example, recalling words um, and speech, but also you can work on the more new information as well. But for that kind of stimulation, you need to go to a specialist for that, somebody who does rehabilitation. So I, I, I hope that answers your question, but that, that's a great question to, uh, to follow up with a research project. Um, we have another question from Sandy. Give me one second. Yeah, she asked, will you receive the same benefits from reading a book online versus reading a physical book? Well, the information that you get is the same, but I don't know if, if you know, I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I think it is better to read than to not read at all. And certainly the physical book, you have the book in your hand. There may be more associations formed because you you're having kind of like a the whole package right of the learning experience the book the turning the pages things like that but the information is the same so i don't know if there'd be a difference I kind of like whatever you like better would be the would be what you should be doing these are great questions they the are. next one is would you describe the roman room method sure can I uh, answer though Claire's question first? Because it. I'm sorry. Did can I, I answer Claire's question first? Because she oh. asked a, a related question. Do book groups have any more benefit than reading a book without discussion? Uh, I think yes. And I think, first of all, whenever you're discussing something, you're going into it in greater depth. So you actually might be able to remember the book better because you're getting involved in a enhanced learning process through the discussion. You also have the social contact and you're sharing ideas and you might be making associations and learning something different because you have the input of everybody, right? Than you would be if you were um, doing just learning by yourself. So, we know from memory training studies too, that people, most of these studies that teach like the Roman room, et cetera, that people really do well in small groups, even better than learning something on their own by themselves. So all having that social interaction is a plus. Okay, okay. So, so now the Roman room question. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me see if I can do this in a bullet point way that you can that is understandable. Um, everybody has a house. Well, not everybody, right? If you're homeless, but those who live in a home have 
a house. It could be an apartment, it could be a mansion, it could be a studio, but we have a house and we know that house well. We don't have to memorize that house. We know where everything is. And we all have a way of entering that house. Like for me, I always enter my house, you know, either through the garage or through the front door. I go through my living room. I usually go to my kitchen first. Then I might use the bathroom and then I'll make my way to the bedroom. So that's my journey in my house, right? Come in through the entryway. I, by the way, I walk through my living room, go to the kitchen, bathroom, bedroom. And so I can think of that then as how many rooms? Living room, kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, four. And each of those rooms has a um, has furniture in it, right? So in, in my living room, there is a couch and uh, there's a coffee table and there's a fireplace. And then in the kitchen, there's my stove on an island and there's refrigerator and there's a sink. And there's much more, but those are three main items in that room. In the bathroom, you know, there's the shower, the, the toilet, and let's say the sink. And in the bedroom, there is um, nightstand, bed, and ceiling fan. So look at that. I just don't even need to learn it, right? Nobody needs to learn it. You all know what's in your bedrooms and, and your house. So now you take, an, you take a list of items that you want to remember, and you link each item with a... Um, object in one of those rooms and you do it in order. So for example, I will, I'm going to, I'm going to use stuff like a bottle and a remote, a mouse, my cell phone, that's four items. So bottle, remote, cell phone, no, mouse and cell phone in that order, right? And then let me say, I want to add one more thing to it. I'm going to read, find something on here. God knows what I come up with. <laughs> this, is a, this is a gadget that you hang uh, musical instruments on your wall with. Let's just call it a gadget. So I've got one, two, three, four, five. So now I'm going to say, how am I going to remember those five items? So what I do is I walk in my house, First thing I come to is my living room and I have a couch, right? I said, I have a couch. I've got a bottle of water. So I'm going to picture me pouring this water all over my couch, number one. Then I have a coffee table and then I have the coffee table. This is a remote. So I'm going to put the remote on the coffee table. I got to make it though more memorable. So maybe I'll, this is terrible, but I'll smash the remote on my coffee table. I'm gonna put an image of that in my mind. So I've got an image of water spilling all over. I've got a broken remote on my coffee table and I'm gonna throw my mouse in the fireplace. And now those are my images. Now I walk into the kitchen and I have two more things to place. So I am gonna put my cell phone, cook it on my stove. It's gonna be in flames on my stove. And I'm going to hang my, my gadget, instead of on the wall, I'm going to hang it on my refrigerator. So those are my items. And now I say, okay, I have those images. So now what I do when I want to remember those items, I take a mental walk through my house. A mental walk in that same order, never change the order. And I'm going to say, okay, what was my first image? My first image was water poured all over my couch. So that reminds me of the water bottle. My second image was a broken remote on my coffee table. So that, and my remote by the way is white. So I'll, I'll put that in my memory. Okay. Third image is my melting mouse in the fireplace. And my fourth image is, I'm, I'm guess I'm all about fire today. I'm cooking my cell phone on the stove. And finally, I'm going to put that gadget on my, on my um, refrigerator, okay, the hanger. 
And so what are my objects? And if I had to remember them in order, that's, I don't even have to remember the order. The order is built in to the technique, right? So it's bottle, remote, mouse, cell phone, and gadget. And that's, that's how it works. So I've done it many times. What you need to do to learn it is you need to do it, what I kind of just told you, right? You need to first pick the rooms in your house and pick three to four pieces of furniture distinct per room, memorize all that, which you don't have to memorize because you already know it. And then you're going to associate each item that you need to remember with each location in the room as you walk through your house mentally. And that's how you remember everything that's on your list. This is probably the most powerful method you could ever learn to remember a list of items. And of course, if you have four rooms with three uh, you know, pieces of furniture in each room, you can remember 12, 12 items, right? If you have four rooms and four pieces of furniture in each room or a lamp or whatever, a rug, whatever you wanna use, then you can remember 16 things. And so it's exponential. So anyway, that's how that works. Everybody's like, oh no. <laughs> but really, once you get down, once you get that down, that's it. You never have to learn it again. Okay, we have one final question, I believe, from Anna Copeland about um, could we have the website for the opportunities available for 50 and over? Yeah, so go to. Let me see, make sure this works. Here it is. There it is. So if you if you just go to um, if you if you go to the website, you just click on that link. It takes you right to the senior resource directory, and I can share it. Can you see that? Yes. Yes, we can. So here you have on the left, you have campus resources accessibility. So if, if you need any assistance or just to know what's accessible, health and awareness, dementia care, volunteer opportunities, research opportunities, here's lifelong learning, podcasts and museums. And we link out to all the museums. I don't know if you see that, like the hammer, the sculpture garden, botanical garden. So if you want to go to a sports event, you can see that you can get you can get to the ticket office from here, uh, community events. So planetarium, I didn't even know we had a planetarium. Isn't that bad? And uh, so anyway, it's one stop shopping. And actually, if you think we need something up there that we failed to put on there, um, you can email us and let us know. What we can't do is we cannot advertise like any, this is a nonprofit organization. So we can't say if you want a good dinner in Westwood, go to the great Northern Chinese dumpling house, which I hear is excellent. But I would, we would not be able to put that on the website because we can't do that. So, but we can tell you where to go eat on campus. So that's, um, that's a, a quick tour of our of our website.
our website is still under development, so we're going to get a new one. Uh, UCLA is updating all of its websites, so we're, we're going to get a, a nicer one, um, but we have to wait our, our place in line. Any other any other questions on the oops 1130 I don't think we have time. Oh, second the Northern Cafe. I hear it's really good. I gotta go. Oh Ma Maria, you're in we say, yeah. I just realized that. Thank you. I was saying there's a lot of uh, comments in the chat. Thank you so very much. Encouraging, informative, inspiring. Um Lots of thank you, great presentation. Uh, I agree, um, I know Lamb agrees. Um, it, does anybody have any last questions that we need to address before we sign off? Well, I think that's okay. it. Well, thanks, and thanks for being such a great audience. And just remember, it, you don't, there's no magic thing that you need to do for lifelong learning, right? And you don't have to spend a whole heck of a lot of money. Um, so uh, anybody can keep learning and just follow your curiosity and your interests. That's, that would be my recommendation. And thank you so much. Thank you so all much. Right. Take care, everybody. Yeah, I appreciate it. What a wonderful yeah. talk. Thank and you. thank you to all the participants for showing up. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take, Take care. care. Take care.